Hello everyone. Today we'll be talking about albumin versus saline and in next few series of lecture we'll try to hash the things out which one would help your patient better. So let's start with the first part. Which one of these two IV fluids will increase intravascular volume more? Is it albumin or is it saline? So let's say you are called for a patient who was hypotensive and you ordered 500 cc of 5% albumin to the patient and your attending asks you why not a liter of saline? You will hear many opinions about this. The proponents of albumin would tell you that albumin increases intravascular volume more than the saline. Albumin removes fluid from the interstitium and uses less volume. While the supporters of saline will tell you that albumin does not result in improved outcomes in terms of mortality and renal failure, it is too expensive and its effect don't last long. So which one of them should you listen to? And I think more important thing is to understand how albumin works and its pathophysiology so that you can actually make up mind for yourself. So we'll discuss some of the relevant information about these two IV fluids first before proceeding so that you can have a deeper understanding. So how much does 500 cc of 5% albumin increases your intravascular volume? And on the same note, what about 20% albumin and how do these compare to normal saline? The reason you need to know how much IV fluid improve your intravascular volume because you use these to improve perfusion. And you need to know how much of this intravascular volume increases when you use a given IV fluid. Also knowing how fluid shifts when you give this is going to make you make a better judgment call for your patient and understand the literature better. So there are only two steps to figure these things out. First, know the fluid distribution in the body and know where the IV fluid that you are giving will go. A 70 kilo person has approximately 28 kilograms of solid and 42 kilograms of water. The water is distributed between your ICF and ECF. ICF is around 25 liters and your ECF is around 15 liters. The intravascular volume is around 5 liters. And understand that intravascular volume has two components to it as well. The intracellular part, which is your hematocrit, that is your RBCs and WBCs, and the plasma, which is your extracellular part, and that's your 60%, while your hematocrit is 40%. And certainly this will change depending on the degree of anemia. There are certainly differences in fluid distribution between the patients depending on your age, gender, obesity, dehydration, volume status, etc. But my goal is to give you an approximate idea about this as an adult as children are very different and understand how to calculate the fluid distribution so that you can use these principles to extrapolate into elderly and sometimes neonates as well if you know your proportion of your fluid distribution. So let's see how does one liter of normal saline improves your intravascular status by. Saline, as you know, is distributed only in your extracellular compartment. So it will distribute evenly in your ECF between your interstitium and intravascular. In this case, the ratio of 12 is to 3. Since it is almost isoosmotic, there will be no net movement of water from ICF to ECF. So the amount of saline remaining intravascular will be equal to the plasma volume divided by the total ECF volume and that will give you around 200 cc's. So when you give a liter of saline, only 200 cc's remain intravascular and the rest 800 leaks out to your interstitium. Since there are differences in fluid distribution among patients and osmolality of different crystalloids is slightly different, approximately 150 to 200 cc's out of a liter of isosmotic balanced crystalloid remain intravascular. Since only one-fifth of your fluid remains intravascular to improve your cardiac output, when you give somebody 100 cc per hour of crystalloid to improve the perfusion or blood pressure in your patient, you are actually giving them around only 20 cc per hour of intravascular fluid because just 80 cc is seeping out. Since your intravascular volume is around 5000 cc, you are effectively giving around 5 cc of intravascular augmentation every 15 minutes. That's around 1 teaspoon. So you can see why this thing will not really help improve your perfusions or improve your blood pressures. So if you really need to improve your blood pressures or perfusion, make sure that you use boluses rather than drips. So how much salt does a bag of normal saline has? Since it is 0.9%, that means 0.9 gram per 100 cc. So it is around 9 gram of salt. And this is important to know because if you remember your heart failure patients, they are on 2 gram salt restricted diet for a reason. A liter of bag has around five times higher amount of salt than they require in a day. And this is another problem with the fluid at 100 cc an hour. 
if you are giving a fluid that is not improving your perfusion, you're just simply giving patient salt. And in 24 hours, you gave them 2.5 liters of saline, and that would amount to around 22 gram of salt in one day. That is, in one day, you have given this patient over 10 days worth of salt. So always make sure that you put a stop date and time. Since most of your medications are also constituted in saline, make sure that you account for that as well. Having said that, crystalloid are actually the best fit for resuscitation. Always make sure that you check for your patient fluid responsiveness and fluid tolerance, and always evaluate risk and benefit of fluid boluses. If the patient needs IV fluids, do not hold back. So what about 5% albumin? Albumin is normally constituted in normal saline. And since it is 5%, that means you've got 5 gram per 100 cc of albumin. That is total of 25 grams. So 500 cc of 5% albumin is nothing but 500 cc of normal saline and with 25 grams of albumin in it. So how does it change your intravascular volume? Well, the saline part is going to redistribute in your ECF as we talked about. So only 100 cc of it will remain intravascular. The albumin is going to remain intravascular and will have that magic pull and let's try to figure out how much fluid can it pull from its surrounding tissues. Most of you remember that albumin is a large molecule, so its contribution to osmolality is minimal. If you calculate it, 20 grams of albumin contributes only about 0.3 millimole of osmolality, and this is much lower than the sodium and chloride which is present in the plasma. However, albumin doesn't leak out, so it is able to generate around 28 millimeters of mercury oncotic pressure. A large part of this oncotic pressure is contributed by a process called gibbs tonin effect, which occurs because of highly negative charge on albumin. Each molecule of albumin at pH 10.4 has around minus 16 negative charges, and 10 millimeters of mercury out of 28 of that oncotic pressure we talked about is contributed by gibbs tonin effect. We'll talk about gibbs tonin effect in our next lecture. So how do we figure out how much fluid will this albumin pull? And the calculations are a little cumbersome. However, you can perform an experiment where you give the albumin and measure the plasma volume. And there are many studies on this regard. Lemke et al. gave 50 grams of albumin as 5%, 20%, and 25% and measured the increase in plasma volume. 50 grams of albumin increased the plasma volume by around 500 cc despite different concentration used. That means that around 10 ml of plasma volume is increased by every gram of retained albumin. The important thing to understand here is the volume of the fluid given. When you give 1000 cc of 5%, only 490 cc remain intravascular. But when you give 200 cc of 25% albumin, you retain that 200 cc and you gain extra 240 cc. Compare that with crystalloid, where you gave 1000 cc and only 200 cc remained intravascular. There are many studies on this topic. But the volume expansion is highly variable and depends upon the concentration of albumin used, rates of albumin infusion, etiology possibly is the most important. For example, state of glycocalyx, inflammatory states, stress, surgery, anesthesia, etc. Volume status and shock also govern the volume expansion of albumin. To average all these out, a gram of albumin holds on to about 10 ml of water. If you look at 5% albumin alone, the plasma volume expansion of 5% albumin is around 50 to 100%. That means if you give 500 cc of 5% albumin to your patient, your plasma volume will increase between 250 to 500 cc. If you go with average estimate, 25 gram of albumin in our two bottles of 5% will hang on to plasma volume about 250 cc. So the total plasma volume increase will be this 250 cc plus 100 cc from saline that is approximately 350 cc. In other words, of the 500 cc of 5% albumin given, 350 cc stays intravascular and 150 cc leaks out. One of the other ways you can put it is that 5% albumin did not really pull fluid from extravascular compartment, it just didn't lose much water to the extravascular compartment. But the things are a little bit more complicated than that. Remember, 500 cc of saline is going to distribute between interstitium and intravascular space. 25 grams of albumin hangs onto 250 cc of plasma. So you'd be tempted to think that this 250 cc pull came from the interstitium. However, if you pull the fluid from your interstitium, 
the interstitium is going to get more concentrated and it would pull fluid from the intracellular compartment. So in fact, the water comes from both interstitial fluid and intracellular compartment in proportion of their volume. So from ICF, you get around 170 cc's and from interstitial space, you get 80 cc's. So this 250 cc is going to come equally from your interstitium and your intracellular compartment. The word pull is a little bit confusing when you use it with albumin because the fluid movements are much more complex. For example, if you looked at our study by Lemke et al, when you gave 200 cc of 25% albumin, you had extra 220 cc that came into your intravascular compartment from the extravascular However, when you used 1000 cc of 5% albumin, around 500 cc leaked out and only 500 stayed in your intravascular compartment. So overall, 5% albumin increases the intravascular volume more than the saline. If you look at 25% albumin, it is equivalent to giving your patient 100 cc of normal saline and 25 gram of albumin. Note that this solution is hyperoncotic. Each 50 ml of this product is osmotically equivalent to 250 ml of plasma. Similar to our previous calculations, 20 cc of saline will remain intravascular and the pull from albumin will amount to around 250 cc. So total plasma volume increase will be 270 cc. So this is interesting because you give 100 cc and your plasma volume increased actually by 270 cc. So let's see where does that extra 170 cc came from. Again, 100 cc of saline will be distributed between interstitium and intravascular and 25 gram of albumin is going to hang on to 250 cc of water and this 250, 80 will come from interstitium, 170 come from intracellular compartment. So overall that extra 170 cc came from intravascular compartment. So you really pull fluid out of intracellular compartment than interstitium when you use 25% albumin. Most people will use 25% albumin as it does not contribute much to interstitial volume. So you have to understand the dynamics of fluid shifts with time whenever you give IV fluids. Say for example, you gave a liter bolus infusion in 15 minutes, your plasma volume should increase from five to six liters. And let's say you looked at 30 minutes after you started the infusion. If the capillaries are completely leaky and you use normal saline, amount of volume that remains intravascular will be around 20% and that would be achieved as soon as your liter bolus stops. However, the capillaries are not completely leaky, so it will take some time for the normal saline to re between all the spaces. So if you look at 30 minutes, your total plasma volume will be higher than 20%. Since albumin is much slower to get eliminated from intravascular space, total plasma volume drop would be much slower. With 20% albumin, since it's also pulling fluids from your extravascular space, you will see that your volume is higher than 6 liters, but slowly over time, at Stanwix mirror 5% albumin. Unfortunately, the fluid shifts that we just talked about are a very nuanced view of the whole picture. Whenever you give IV fluid, there are so many other processes happening inside the body that can affect your volume distribution. This picture kind of summates all the processes that this fluid might encounter. So the amount of fluid remaining intravascular depends upon volume status, timing, state of glycocalyx, inflammation, vasodilatory or vasoconstrictive state, venodilation, shock, and many other factors. So whenever you read a study, always look at the assumptions made in that study and examine what group of patient was that study done on. Now we have understood how to calculate the fluid movements and shifts in the body. Let's see if we can calculate how much intravascular volume increases with a liter of 5% dextrose and a liter of 3% normal saline. This will help you understand why you don't use these fluids for resuscitating your septic or hypovolemic patients. In summary, when you give IV fluids, only 200 cc of a liter of isotonic crystalloid remains intravascular when you use 5% albumin, only 350 out of 500 cc remains intravascular. Some of it leaks into interstitium and some of it comes from intracellular compartment. When you give 25% albumin, your intravascular volume increases by 270 cc for every 100 cc of 25% albumin. 
However, it pulls 170 cc from intracellular compartment and can result in intracellular dehydration. This picture summarizes what we have learned so far. 5% albumin will result in more increase in intravascular volume as compared to normal saline, while 25% albumin will have the least amount of effect on your interstitial fluid accumulation. We'll discuss if these differences are clinically relevant in our subsequent lectures. These are the references. Thank you.